welcome to the uh, British Computer Society's Special Interest Group in Software Testing. Uh, so today we've got a special session about the Testing Stories ebook. Um, so before I ask our committee member, uh, Mike Harris, to introduce that book, today we have uh, four of the authors who are all going to give uh, talks. And we're really keen to promote the Testing Stories ebook because it's, uh, it's all about generating money for good causes and Mike will talk a little bit more about where things are with that. Um, on a BCS note, our next meeting will be on the 1st of November when we have an annual general meeting. Um, we'll be talking about what's happened over the last year and what's going to happen over the next year. Um, we do have a position open on the committee for someone to really advocate for people early in their careers in software testing. It doesn't have to be someone young, um, but it does have to be someone who's relatively new to the profession and wants to help other people learn about the profession. Okay, so before we go to and introduce our speakers, Mike, could you introduce the, the book, please? Okay, yeah, so please, the, the book Testing Stories is uh, a book has been written by testing professionals from around the globe. Uh, we were all asked to contribute a story of around 1500 words. Um, over 30 people have contributed stories. Um, they're from all over the world. Uh, the idea is that every tester has a story and so we've each contributed a story. Um, we had a discussion uh, on, between ourselves as to where the money should go, what we should do with it. We decided that we would give all the money to a mental health charity called Open Sourcing Mental Illness. And uh, so we've so far raised just under $1,500 uh, for the charity. And it would be great if a few additional people tonight were to buy the book and get us just over that point. It'd be an even bigger success. Um, when we contributed stories, they were all peer reviewed. Um, the book's been published with a very nice piece of artwork by Bruce the Legend, who I'm sure some of you will know from uh, Twitter. And uh, the whole project was, was led by Melissa Fisher, who is I know listening to the webinar tonight. And we should say a very big thank you to Melissa for all the work she did in, in making it happen. Um, so I think now I'll hand over to uh, back to Adam. Thank you very much, thank Mike. You. So tonight, as I say, we've got we've got four authors who will be delivering um, short presentations, and then we're going to take fifteen minutes at the end for questions to to all of the authors. Um, so I think we are just using the chat. If you want to pose a question, and I'll gather them up and um, uh, host the questions at the end. So first of all, can I introduce Louise Woodhams, who will be telling us about why an API story? Hello, Hi, Louise. So, right, I will share my screen. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep, fabulous. And you can all hear me good? I will away. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, why an API story? Um, honestly, I felt like I had a saga to tell when I wrote testing stories. Um, I love API testing. It makes the cogs in my brain well, a little bit faster. Um, I felt like I'm adventuring when I'm testing an API. Um, it sits really well as a nice bridge between manual and automated testing as well, without being too daunting and extremely demanding. Um, I wanted to get a bit meta with this tiny talk. Um, every tester has a story to tell regardless of how long they've been testing, uh, their confidence in their skill level. Um, all the stories from this book come from a fast, selection of skills, backgrounds and experiences. You don't have to be an expert at something to share your findings. Um, we all learn so much from each other and I believe that testers are the best humans and great people to absorb knowledge from. Um, others can gain from your trials and tribulations, your passions and your breakthroughs. But how? Put yourself out there. Networking, meetups, forums, Twitter, connect, compare and contrast the and engage with other testers. Put your testing in the spotlight. Challenge your testing and work retros. Ask for feedback regularly. I know testers that do self retros. Learn what you're doing great, doing well, and what you could be doing better, and use this information to adapt. Put that stuff down uh, in Notepad on OneNote somewhere. Put it up on your wall if it helps. Don't shut it away and keep referring to it. I recommend one note if you're anything like me, your handwriting has become some sort of hieroglyphic scroll of doom. Uh, 
So then what do you do with what you know and what you've learned? How do you get good as the pro gamers would say? Get an idea, something you want to talk about or a story you want to tell um, where your experience you think could be useful to others or even if it's just something you want to rant about, that could be helpful too. Um, get a goal. Um, goals can be tough sometimes, but giving yourself a practical point to reach or a deadline can help with the process. Get panic. <laughs> um, allow yourself to fill out of your debt sometimes. Learning curves are terrifying, but great places to be. And get growing. It's all growing pains. Something that's hard now in time will be less so in time. And you do yourself favors by doing the work now and up front. Sorry, uh, a little bit of HTTP humor code here. I could not resist. So what then? A post-mortem, aha. <laughs> uh, so I still have a problem with brackets and that only really resolved itself when I started using Visual Code, Visual Studio Code uh, with Cypress and JS. I downloaded some fancy extensions to make everything a little bit more clear. Um, I'm using better tools for things as well. When I started writing JSON, I was just using Notepad++, um, but I started using Visual Studio Code with these fancy extensions and um, putting stuff directly into Postman as well, which just made it a whole lot easier and saved me a whole lot of time. So bringing it back to how you can start API testing, start small and consider how you can apply context and API from the manual testing you're used to doing. For example, I think the easiest tests to think through are authentication tests. They're similar to how you would test a login screen. You can get some pretty decent assertions thinking this way as well. Postman even has some kind of has some code examples to get you started with the requests and tools like Bscepter, which I'm in love with, um, is useful for mocking out even SOAP calls. Um, it's really easy to set up for free. I've even bullied my new team into using it. I did crowbar the rest theme in here a little bit, didn't I? And it worked quite well, I think, until I got to this slide. So what should we delete? Personally, uh, I'm really bad at deleting things. Um, I have a faulty purge tool. I'm a memory hoarder, though this pandemic has made it harder for me to remember things. So delete what is old and out of date. Tech moves pretty fast and documentation, both your own and your company's needs to be kept relevant. Bin off stuff that just isn't going in your brain, isn't getting in your head. Archive it for later, clear it out for another time. Pick it up again later. Self-doubt. Be kind to yourself when you're learning, sharing and writing. Hell, always be kind. So I think this is more of a patch than a delete. Deletes are pretty dangerous, but you can't make an API without breaking some eggs, right? <laughs> um, I'm hoping this tiny talk doesn't get a 400, but I feel a little bit like a 418 right now. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Louise. That was great. It was almost poetic. I try. Um, I think Andrew's next. That's right, Andrea. You're going to tell us about tester relationship statuses. Hello, yes. I'm going quickly to share my screen with you. Just give me a place a bit of a feedback. If you can see it. Yep. Okay, great. So, as Adam said, I'm Andrea. And today I'm talking about a personal story. It's my relationship status as a tester. And as you can see below, it's a bit complicated. So to give you some background why my relationship is a bit complicated, I try to explain myself where I'm coming from and where I went. So I was a solo tester for many times in my career. I'm a tester for more than 10 years now, working most of the time on my own product, being part of a development team, knowing how to develop, how to collaborate with developers, but rarely work together with testers. So I know how to observe, share my observations and how to give feedback of behavior I see in the software to my development team, interact with my product manager or have a conversation about the design with the UI designer. But I seldom had worked with another tester or shared a project with. So then one day, um, the team grew. We got another tester in the team. So we have been two. 
from solo to duo, so to say. And I was happy about the fact that I was not alone anymore, that I have become company, that there was another person I could try, share my work with, and there was someone else I could discuss my testing ideas with. So we started to get everything settled. I showed him the repository, shared our tools, our approaches, our procedures. The first week passed by, and then guess what? It was 2020, early beginning of the year, and yes, the pandemic hit in. We all have been sent home, and from then we worked remotely. A bit of an extra challenge was by starting the relationship. The new tester was a junior, freshly graduated from the university, never worked in testing before, and then working remotely was a bit of a challenge for us because we have never been trained to use 100% remotely. So after the first weeks passed by, the normal life kicked in again. We tried to split our work, but we didn't really know how to do. Um, by all keeping that in mind, we still had a team of developers surrounding us, relying on us to help them to deliver good quality software. So we were kind of in our own struggles and trying still to do our job. Um, I was going through moments into a situation where I was irritated, was maybe a bit annoyed and even frustrated with the days when they didn't went like, we, like they should. So it was a tough time for me personally. And that somehow got me remembered of a friend of mine who shared her story with me a couple of years ago. She was a single for some time living her life like she wants to be. Um, she, was, she had her job, she had her own flat and did whatever she wants to do, whenever she wants to do. But then one day she met the guy, they got to know each other, they fell in love and eventually they decided to share a life and a home. And for them, she, soon after the honeymoon phase was over and she realized her flat is not longer her flat, but it's now there. Um, she shared her experiences and emotions with me. She shared episodes of irritation, frustration and annoyance. You know, you heard the words already before from me, right? So basically my friend and I, we're going through, we were going through the same emotional roller coaster, but with a bit different context. She in a romantic relationship, I in a professional one. And that got me thinking, if there could be a similarity between sharing a home and sharing a workplace, what does it mean to us to let someone new into our home or to, and, uh, into our product and our project? Um, how does it feel for us to free up some space, let someone new come in, let, them, let a new person feel welcome and explore the new home or the new workplace and developing their own ideas? So I'm pondering about these questions in, in my text, in the article, in the testing story. And during my way of creating and starting a new relationship, I found some principles very helpful to me. So there's the tolerance. We all know people are different. We celebrate diversity. And I had one eye-opening moment when I sat down, sat down with my with my colleague. We, we were thinking about a new feature we want to test, bouncing testing ideas, noting down whatever comes to our mind. And I just realized by doing this together, by pairing up, we were coming up with so much more ideas than each on our own. But this also needs a good portion of tolerance and patience to let the other person think out loud, even if it may appear a bit odd, weird, or a stupid idea. So, that was quite a big moment for me to learn. Another thing I had to learn was to learn about my new peer. What makes the person pick? What, he, what is he passionate about? What do he love about testing? And what he does not love so much about testing. So we need to figure out our personalities. We get to know each other. And I try to put aside biases and assumptions and stop the guessing about what he would like to do, what tasks I could share with him, and started asking him, having a conversation, like asking informally, what, what was the most fun part you did last week? And by that, we figured out that we just complement 
each other pretty well in the testing field. Another thing I learned during my journey of the new relationship I started was the connection and the sharing part. And those both have been the hardest for me personally. So as I said in the beginning, we started soon after the pandemic hit and we have been working from home for many months. Connection isn't that easy then if you don't see each other on a daily basis, if you don't share a desk and just can wave shortly and ask the person to stop by. So I had to motivate myself to connect regularly with him to check in. But I was also very aware of the fact that if we don't connect, we don't have a communication, we simply could not collaborate and share our work. So I, I spent a bit of extra effort on that, but it was not always easy. Some days were tougher than others. And I also understand if you're an introvert person, it just costs you a bit more of extra effort. But I would say it pays out. Um, regarding the sharing part, I had to learn a lot. As I said, I knew how to collaborate with developers. I knew how to write a good bug report. I know how to explain weird behavior in the UI I saw. But I had not really good experience and ideas how to share my expectations regarding testing ideas, how to onboard a junior tester and explain the word of testing to someone new. Um, by that, I had to learn to be precise and clear and narrow it down and guide the person, but also don't be a micromanager and uh, take everything they need to explore away from them. So, and as Louise already said, having a retrospection is a valuable thing. I, I sit down with myself once in a while, reflect on the things which went well in our relationship and the things which didn't went well at all. And I was thinking about what could be different, what could be better, what approach tr to try next. Um, and ultimately, I learned or uh, I had to make myself clear to be kind to myself because we all do make mistakes during our relationships, maybe in private or in business life. We do things we are later terribly sorry about, but we couldn't change them. No matter how hard you regret, it happened and we are just human beings so it's just worth to remind yourself about it being kind to yourself and allow yourself a bit of a break from a relationship whenever you need it that are in short the key principles i picked up while creating while starting my latest relationships as a tester um, i hope you enjoyed the talks today and thank you very much Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you for sharing what you learned. That was very insightful. Okay, um, so next we have John, John McGee, who's going to talk about the relationship between software testing and abstract art. Hi there. Um, thanks to Andrea and Louise, two great talks there. I hope I can, I can follow it up. So uh, the Black Square talk was it was originally part of a larger presentation relating to modern art and testing which I'd run a couple of times internally and at local meetups and was lucky enough to be invited to run at Test Bash Manchester last year. So when testing stories came about I thought a story about things that tell stories would be a perfect fit and I'm sure you've all heard the saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. So the original talk came about through visits to art galleries I'd sort of been going to them when I was away on holiday a few times and I'd sort of been looking at paintings, but I'd never really understood stood the more abstract ones, the more modern art type ones, Jackson Pollock and Rothko and various other people like that. So I thought, what 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 would I do as a tester? And I'd find an oracle. I'd go away and obviously I couldn't carry an art professor around with us for the rest of my life. So I bought a book. And as I was reading the book, I realised there were so many similarities between the way artists and testers work. So I realized sort of the, the non-cubist nail and the cubist painting was the same as the long leash heuristic, which keeps us rooted into reality for the purpose of the mission while we're exploring and doing our testing. I found out how America's greatest modern artist, Jackson Pollock, was almost dismissed as worthless by the world's greatest art collector, Peggy Guggenheim, when he came, until he came to the attention of someone whose opinion matter, mattered. 
I found out that the world's greatest art movements had manifestos, which then led me to think about mission statements in the Agile Manifesto. I learned artists use focus and defocusing techniques, and I linked these to techniques we used when we were exploring and where we're drilling into things to work out the steps to reduce issues. I read about Cezanne and how he turned the art world on his head, whereas artists in the past used to just paint what they saw, Cezanne actually questioned what he saw in the same way that explore, uh, we do where we're exploring. And then I thought about Michelangelo and how he suffered from imposter syndrome and he ran away to Florence just as, as he was about to start work on the Sistine Chapel. Louise talked about panicking and how it's good to get out of your depth sometimes. Michelangelo did exactly that here and he ended up producing one of the greatest pieces of art the world has ever seen. And we'll move on to the black square. So while I continue on with the talk, I want you to have a look at this painting for the next sort of minute or so, just try to try to have a think about what this might represent. And then I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail in 30 seconds, a minute or so. So as I was continuing through the book, I saw how the surrealists painted with ideas, feeding off ideas, and that linked into their exploration and our exploration. I noticed how tools and technologies enabled an artist to innovate. For example, a simple tube of paint, when that was invented, it enabled the impressions to do what they did, to capture light in the, that particular moment in time. In the same way that tools, advances in tools and technologies help us to improve the way we work and to do our work. And, and at the very last, I blew my mind with Malavich's black square and I lost endless nights of sleep contemplating it and trying to work out what it could mean. And now I'll show you why. So hopefully you've had to think about this, this picture here, this black square. And if you can, could you put in the chat what you, what you might think it might represent? And I'll carry on with the talk while they're doing that. So the black square itself, it was the first example of abstract art. So before this, artists painted sort of recognizable objects and themes. So you had the Mona Lisa, it was a lady in the nice little background and various other sort of things that were recognizable. But in this painting, the artists wanted to look at it and work it out yourself. There was nothing like this had ever existed before in the world of art. And he just wanted people to sort of Look at it and look at it and come up with a meaning themselves. So we're looking there, and there's a few sort of suggestions there: the depth of the unknown, avoid known unknowns, access to black paint, <laughs> and there's, there's, I've, asked, I've run this before, and there's a lot of things. There was a lot of really dark things came came up, sort of nighttime and death, and 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 really sort of dark things. But Malevich himself, he felt that the painting represented the art world turned on its head. He wanted basically wanted to start a revolution in painting, which is exactly what he did. It's what you'd call a ground zero painting. So if you remove the lady in the landscape from the Mona Lisa, what you're left with, a black square. But it's a pretty problematic painting to interpret in that respect without knowing this. Malevich wanted to remove objectivity from painting. So to him, it's a perfect representation of that. He said looking at it invoked the sensation of non-objectivity. But on the other hand, which this is the part that I find amazing, it represents everything, every painting that ever existed, every thought, every feeling, every single thing that has ever or will ever exist. And I think that's what blew my mind out about it. But how does that link to testing, you might ask? So we could have went on all day coming up with meanings. We could have spent weeks and weeks and you'd never know that you came to the right conclusion because as testers, we need context and requirements to let us know when, that we can say when our testing is complete. With both simple and complex software, you can test without them. But if you aren't getting information that you require, it becomes almost impossible to know when, when it's done. So in this situation, I was the oracle. So it's important to know who or what these are when we're testing. People, help systems, books, comparable systems. But it's also interesting to know that we all brought, bring our own thoughts and biases to the table here. So while testing, we know that it's important to recognize that we have these. Sometimes we can use them to our advantage. Other times we need to try to overcome these. One other thing about this painting, which, which I find quite bizarre, Malevich painted four of these. He wasn't happy with just one black square. He painted four of them. It's just a simple black square, so I can't understand the reason behind that. But, but in testing, repetition can be important. So if you want to re repeat, repeat a test several times, it pays to automate it. Well, it may pay to automate it. So reasons for repetition could include regression, benchmarking, finding intermittent issues, the importance of the test, as always, we've always got to consider cost versus value and what could be gained by some tests that we mightn't perform. 
So one of Malevich's other paintings sold for $60 million a few years ago. But if the black square was to go to the market, it would sell for much, much more, which is strange considering it's something that you or I could easily paint. But what people are paying for is the idea. Malevich came up with it first. So as testers, people pay us for our skills, ideas, and creativity. So that's enough of the black square for now. Let's look, have a look at a little bit of a prettier painting. So this is a painting called Kandinsky's Composition. Com, it's painted by a guy called Kandinsky. And it's called Composition 31. It's also got a subtitle, which I'm going to leave out for obvious re for reasons that will become obvious in a while. So there's an exercise called Say, Think, Wonder. And variations are, of it are used around the world in, in sort of things like the FBI and other crime agencies, military intelligence, schools use it for students of all ages. Surgeons do similar exercises to improve their sort of observational skills. The FBI that I mentioned before, they use it to improve their descriptive skills when writing crime scene reports. So what I want you to do, I want you to look at the painting closely, look at it from bottom to top, left to right, corner to corner, and I want you to pick out something. It could be a shape, it could be a color. And in the chat, just tell us what you see. What do you think that's, that little shape might represent? You can pick out anything in the, in the painting. So again, if you just stick that in the chat and we'll have a little bit of fun with it, hopefully. <laughs> so we've got a boot. Two people at a party, sure, wow. Something's moving. Is this this one here at the bottom right, yeah? You can see mouth, oh yeah, got the mouth. Oh, that's pretty close, Andrea, the 40 feet ocean container. So if we're gonna do this exercise in full, obviously we've only got five minutes or so to, to run through it. You could go through and describe everything in the painting in detail. You'd start off with things that, you, that you're sure, sure about. And then you'd start focusing on things that you aren't sure about, aren't sure about, you'd start questioning what could it be. So now that you've picked out a little sort of section of the painting and you've and you've sort of put what you think that could be, it moves to the think part. So now now we would think about the rabbit hole. Of the <laughs> now we'd have a think about the picture overall. What do you think the whole painting's depicting? Can you, can you think, what does it make you think about? Does it remind you of anything? And again, that answers in the chat. And we'll see if anybody comes close. The boat's good, Melissa. That's, that's very close. Person carrying the tray. The Malmstrom's pretty good as well. A lot of good, quite, quite good answers in there. But I'll give you, I'll, 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 so, I'll sort of go through now and I'll point out a few things in the painting. So you should, you should probably get it. So you see here, there's two boats and there's big water splashes here from cannonballs and things like that. Somebody pointed out the mouth before. There's a, that's a shark. There's a city that's sort of toppling in the background here. And again, more cannonball splashes here. And I think, I'm not too sure, but I think that might be the Grim Reaper closing in on, on the two boats there. You can see his scythe and things like that and the sort of the, the part of movement. So, oop. so we're getting there. But so, so that's the sort of things that you would do with that, that painting. And the next part would be the wonder part. So the, the painting pretty much represents two boats fighting. And the next part would be the wonder part. So if you could ask any questions about the paintings, if you had the artist stand right in front of you, what would you ask him? So it could be, I wonder why you painted that. I wonder how you painted that. Just I wonder all the sort of questions you could ask about this painting would be the next part. So Melissa's prompted us there just to finish off for a bit of fun. You've got the two boats fighting there, remember the the city collapsing, the cannonball splashes in the water, the shark. If you had to pick a name for the painting, let's see if anybody can guess what it could be. If you just put your, your guesses in the chat. And I'll give you a round of applause if you get it, that can be the prize. 
the rails from. Oh, I've got to go down. Battle, battle's close. So the painting itself is called the sea battle. And that pretty much just to finish off, it's a nice fun little exercise you can take away and you could run it with your teams or even just do it by yourself. Doing it by yourself is quite fun as well. There's plenty of paintings to pick from. And obviously we've cut it down there. They're quite, quite short to fit in the time frame. But you can push it out and work or pick, picking out the multiple shapes and just inscribing the whole painting itself. And hopefully that would that should help you improve sort of descriptive questioning and observational skills. And with that, it's over to Mike, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And yeah, last we have Mike Harris. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, well, thank, well, thank you very much, John. Um, it was really great to hear that. And thank you very much, Louise and Andrea, for your uh, presentations. Uh, it says, refuse Google, refuse to connect. That's a great start, isn't it? Okay, so it's verify it's you. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Uh, I've got to look at my phone. Blimey. I didn't do this earlier on. You can tell this is live. Okay, right. So please just talk about yourselves for one second. Um, yes, I can tell my phone it is me and it will let me in. Okay, and now I can go up here and get to my slides. And... Here we are. Great. Sorry for that short interlude. Um, yeah, so my talk is about uh, uh, agile transformation that I was part of a couple of years ago. Um, my name is Mike Harris, and uh, to say the book is about, the uh, premise of the book is that every tester has a story. And my story is about my role as a test leader in agile transformation. I now work for Gecko Board. Uh, this transformation was while I was working at a different startup. And I'll quickly talk through the transformation and then talk through some of the things. Uh, before we had the transformation, we were working in a, a waterfall system. Um, it took us a month to get code into production. We had operated in two week sprints. We had a two week development sprint, which when the developers would produce a release candidate for us to test. This was then followed by a two week testing sprint during which the testers would run manual regression scripts and do manual testing of new features. And at the end of the sprint, we would then start a new sprint where we'd run the same manual testing sprint scripts again and test the new features and so on and so forth. It was very much like that, the myth of Sisyphus, you know, where Sisyphus had to roll a, a rock up a hill. And when he got to the top of the hill, the same rock rolled down again, and he had to start rolling the rock back up the hill again. That, that was very much how, how we were working as testers. Um, the other side of it is actually when we found a bug during the test sprint, the developers had to stop work to fix the bug, and they couldn't return to their work until the bug was fixed, and they could carry on with what they were planning to do. And I would say that collaboration between testers and developers was very difficult in that environment because it was us testers who decided if work passed. Um, I'd also say we often ran out of time. You know, when we planned to produce a feature on a certain date, it, it often didn't happen. And we all became frustrated, both testers and developers, because we could not deliver the functionality we planned when we planned to. And for that reason, we decided that we would move to an agile system. Um, and we'd have an agile transformation. And we started in-house with the dev lead, myself as test lead and the chief technical officer, agreeing a definition of done. Um, I was very keen the definition of done should include that all there should be automated tests for all code changes because I thought this would improve quality. And we also said that continuous integration had to pass on the main branch. And we all did a course and became certified Scrum Masters. This was useful because we learned a lot about Scrum, we learned a lot about the role as a Scrum Master, and we also gained confidence from having the certification. And we were sort of inching towards Agile. But then we hired an agile coach, and this was a sort of revolution. Um, uh, we, we organized development teams, so we had two scrum teams and one Kanban team, hence the picture of the rugby scrum, and all three teams had back-end and full-end develop, back-end and front-end developers so they could take on full stack work. Um, and from a given date, we started working with agile ceremonies, so we had to learn how to work with stand-ups, sprint reviews, and retrospectives, and so on. We also had to learn how to plan using story points. 
we established a sort of an informal scrum of scrums where the dev leads, myself and the product owner would go for a cup of coffee late every morning, uh, which is very useful because uh, we, we could talk through what was happening and uh, build up a good report. Uh, and we also decided to work with continuous delivery. Um, so at the end of our first two week sprint, we produced code that went directly into production. And after we'd done that for a few iterations, we decided to speed things up further and we made a release once every week. So every Wednesday, code went into production. And this was a, a big success for us because uh, we'd cut the length of time it took to get code into production from four weeks to one. And we now had the new situation that actually could merge something into main on a, on a Tuesday and it could be in production on a Wednesday. This was really very positive. Um, one of the important things to do in this was actually to support your staff. There was a huge change for testing because testers no longer ran through these long manual regression scripts. We tested the feature branches and if they passed testing, they were then merged to main. So this was a huge change for us. And it was important to listen to people and take on board their concerns. Um, we have to say at this time, one developer left. They decided it wasn't for him. Um, we kept good relationships with the guy and still had a beer with him from time to time, but he, he did leave. It wasn't for everybody. Uh, something else I did is I, uh, I decided to try and keep a, a track of how often we put a bug into production that we needed to fix and uh, found that we put a a bug into production needed fixing approximately every six weeks. Um, and I plotted this on a chart which went up in the kitchen. But I'd say that was another big success from this system that is improved quality. I think putting only one bug into production every six weeks is really uh, very positive. But then there were lots of lessons to be learned from this process. Um, I think the first lesson to learn is to invest in yourself. Um, when we encounter problems with Agile, we decided to read and find out how things should be done and find out what other teams have done to solve the same problems. And we read widely, particularly book uh, Essential Scrum by Kenneth Rubin, Kanban by David Anderson, and 30 Days Software by Schreiber and Sutherland. Um, for myself in reading all these books, I discovered all the books referred to someone called W. Edwards Deming, whose ideas seemed to underpin all of Lean and Agile. And I became very interested in him and learned a great deal from reading his books. Um, and in that way, I would say an education is a key to agile success. It was actually through educating ourselves that actually was one of the ways that we actually managed to make a success of our, our agile transformation. But it wasn't only education for us. It was also education for senior management. Because one of the things I did learn is that senior management needs to not only support your agile transformation, because that can just be a tick box exercise. Yep, tick. I support Agile, they actually need to understand Agile so that as and when you run into problems, instead of falling back on waterfall solutions, they actually keep you moving towards Agile. Uh, that was a, an important piece of learning. And another way that we invested in our staff, uh, in ourselves, was actually in the way we organised the work, because it's very important for testers to be able to uh, develop a range of skills. And for that reason, they have got the dev leads to agree to um, every dev team in every sprint having a test support card and this test support card would be for the tester to do some scripting automation or programming and that way they could never be overwhelmed by the amount of requests for manual testing and they would always have time in every sprint to do some automation and keep and maintain and develop their programming skills i think building relationships was another really important thing the scrum of scrums that we had every late every morning was very important between myself, the dev leads and the product owner. We built up a good personal relationship there. We had a good rapport. And when we had issues that were difficult to talk about within teams, we had that rapport and we had that positive relationship. And we were able to talk things through between ourselves, which was really a great help. I think one-to-ones are very important. Uh, when I held one-to-ones, to me, it was very important to listen to what everyone had to say and make sure that they felt free to say whatever they, they wanted to say and they could voice any concerns. And that way you could build up trust and build a positive relationship. Um, I think another piece of relation, relationships important is that between testers and developers. And we decided to build on that by using something we call test consultancy and built in the practice that whenever a developer picked up a card, well, the first thing they should do is talk to the tester about how the testers would test it. Because that way the developer could build those tests into their codes. And when the card came to be tested, it would pass. Um, and that way testers and developers built a, a, a constructive relationship. It wasn't about us deciding whether or not something passed. It was actually about creating code together that, that was successful. Um, 
I think the definition of done also helped because that came to represent a sort of consensus across the teams about how we worked and what we, what we regarded as being done. Uh, I also think it was very important to create a safe environment. One of the things I read in Deming was actually, he says that it is management's responsibility to drive out fear. And if there is fear where you work, people won't ask good questions. You need people to ask good questions. And I think that's a very important point. And I think I was able to do that, I think through my one-to-ones by actually creating that as a safe place where people could raise their concerns and I could listen to them. Um, I also worked, looked at the community, created a, a community of practice across the two offices where testers could meet every, every three weeks and testers could rate their successes and failures and we could listen to each other and learn from each other in a safe environment. We also decided that we wanted to learn from failure and we decided that when uh, every, anything went wrong in production, we would find the root cause of it and we used the five whys from Toyota, hence the picture of the Toyota car. And in that way, we were able to identify a, a number of issues which caused problems for us in terms of quality and we were able to address them. Um, I also think retros are important in this way because teams can discuss things that you know, could have been better in the last iteration and learn from those and improve in the future. I also found it was very important to give kudos. And one of the things that I did was actually look at trying to give kudos for teams that were working towards quality. And I brought in a quarterly quality prize where each development team would submit once a quarter all the initiatives that they had taken to improve quality. And senior management would decide which uh, uh, team had uh, made the best initiatives. And that team would get a free lunch on the company as well as winning the, uh, the, the prestige of having won the prize. And that where they got kudos for their efforts. Um, I also think it's very important to praise staff, not only praise people privately, but actually praise people publicly so they can feel the recognition they can get for the, the good things that they're doing. And I think lastly, I'd like to say, don't be afraid of change. Uh, you can, should embrace it because you've learned from it and grow from it. It can take you out of your comfort zone. And if you can't find the support where you're working, I think it's really very good on particular issues. I think it's really very good to lean out into the testing community because many other people have been there too. And there are so many people out there who are prepared to share uh, what they've learned and share the skills that they've developed and will offer you support. So I would say that you know, if you're feeling under pressure, lean into the testing community and ask someone for support. And it's also really important to support your staff because if you can support your staff and help them learn and grow, then in fact, you're going to learn and grow as well. So I'd like to finish there and say thank you very much for everybody and thank you to Louise, John, Andrew for their contributions and thank you particularly for Melissa to, for uh, uh, leading the project. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mike. And um, thank you to Melissa as well for some of the questions coming up on chat. Um, so I, I think we've got one for three of the speakers. So Andrea, what are your top tips for onboarding a new tester into a team? Is there anything you've learned and would do differently? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, I learned a lot on my way. I mean, it was the first tester I ever onboarded. And I mean, it was a bit assumed to be my training newbie. So um, what I learned, I would, I would start to do more pairing up and up front. I, I just follow a cross pairing when we sent home and when I struggled a bit how to connect with them and how to start and how to explain things. Um, so if I would start all over again, I would have the pairing method as my first go-to option to onboard someone. And as I learned on my way, how to share my expectations, um, how to be more clear and precise, I always would insist on uh, doing that more openly. And another thing I would today do differently, um, I had moments of irritation and frustration, uh, but I didn't um, didn't address it right away. I mean, I don't mean with addressing right away, like in the second that happens, but maybe give it a thought, give it a not sleep over for a night, but don't wait for two weeks as I did in the beginning, because I was like, oh, well, um, it's, it's a new person. The person needs, the colleague needs to find his way and needs to get settled by with by that do I acted and giving 
uh, wrong ideas how we work. So today I would just uh, maybe be a bit more straightforward or a bit more right away um, in trying to say no when I mean no and don't wait until the last minute shortly before I'm going to explore because that's just mean to, to the other person and it's also not helpful for, for the relationship at all. Thanks, Andrea. Okay, the next question is for you, John. Are there any other testing games or exercise you recommend doing with your team? I think um, a few of you may be familiar with the, the dice games where you get a set of dice and you apply a formula to them so that each dice, I mean, I'll, I'll post, post a link as well, but basically you'll get a, a big bag of dice and you roll them and you'll apply a formula to the dice. So say if a red dice is rolled, it could the, the number that comes out could always be 17. All odd numbers could could be sort of equal to two, but then the even numbers are just what they are. And you ask the people who are taking part in the game to try to come up with a total. And a lot of it sort of it teaches people sort of simplification techniques and folks and techniques. So instead of rolling all six or ten dice, you'd roll one dice and see what the, the guy who's running the game would come up with. And there's a lot of different rules you can find. It's and I mean it's great fun and it's fun when you're running to see how frustrated people get when when they're actually doing it because they'll think they'll come up with the answer and then you'll you'll go roll them again and they realize they haven't so that's it's a great fun game to play play with teams and and things and i think one of the other ones i do especially with people new to testing and people who haven't really done a lot of mind mapping i'll take a familiar object such as an atm machine and i'll ask them to mind map how they would test that and it's great to see how they're sort of produce, coming up with the ideas and things like that, rather than giving them something complicated, just giving them something familiar is, is a great sort of exercise to do with them, to take, take them through that. And mind mapping as a team is pretty much a, it's one of my favourite things, favourite techniques to use, full stop anyway, so that's all great stuff. I mean, there's loads of other sort of testing puzzles and games out there that you could, it's all Googleable and things like that, but I think those two are my two, two favourite ones. Great, thanks, John. And Mike, a question for you. Um, how do you promote a culture of lessons learned over blame games? Well, I think blame game is something probably we've all experienced as a tester from time to time. Why didn't the tester find that, you know? And then everybody asked, why didn't you know, the, the rest of the development team, why didn't the product owner? It's always, why didn't the tester? And I think you need to talk about um, well, actually, if you're working in an environment like that and you don't get to test the code until it's ready, um, then in fact, uh, the, the quality is already there. It's already built in. And you have to ask about how it was built in. Um, and I, I think you, to do that, is that can sometimes be very complicated um, because you can talk about um, quality being built in in terms of, uh, is there static testing? Is there unit testing? Uh, who was involved in uh, writing the cards, what acceptance criteria there were. And some of those points will require a certain amount of technical knowledge, which maybe project managers haven't got. Um, but actually trying to reveal to them the components that can be, come in to, to create quality, such as code reviews, for instance, which are very important, um, actually can help them see that there are quite a number of things there. Um, and I, I think that, that there is also a deeper point to do with a, a culture and um, uh, an education, because uh, one of the things that I took away from the Agile transformation was, in fact, that we need to get a, a much deeper understanding of Lean and Agile, and, um, because that can help us understand things like why we work in small batches, how we can learn from failure, how we can work in iterations and get better, what we actually mean by building in. So I, I think there's a, a bigger piece of work to do in terms of education. Um, and this is what drove me to do my talks about Deming. But also there are also, if you like, smaller tactical discussions to have within the, the office about actually talking about the role of unit testing, code reviews, static testing, CI, um, about uh, working in a collaborative way, about the three amigos um, and all these different techniques. Um, so. I, I think to answer it, I hope I haven't rambled a bit and I hope I've given you two good answers there, a sort of tactical answer about the techniques and a, a more strategic answer about education. Uh, so thank you. I think for me, Mike, education is definitely key because we had the situation a couple of years ago and we're starting a new project and we're getting things handed over to testing and 
and look, we are come from a culture where we don't sort of point the finger and things like that anyway. Yeah. But um, we we're getting things hand over into test, and then there was sort of about five, ten times as many bugs as, as we're expecting. Now, 100, 100 sort of bugs, easy to find things. Yeah. So we quickly realised it was an education thing. We need to go back and teach the developers yeah. how yeah. to test. And as yeah. soon as we did that, the quality just went like that. It just went right. over. And it, 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 we're getting things more fine and things really fine and really hard to find bugs. So That's I think good. education and working together as a team is key to everything, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Okay. So there's no more questions. Um, so I'd just like to thank all of our speakers tonight. They were great talks. Really good. Um, and everyone that wasn't speaking, I hope you're looking at buying a copy of the book, uh, all for a very good cause. Okay, so that closes this session of SIGIS. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.